We're calling this uh, presentation the texture of worship. We have sung, we have praised God, and we've done all of that just after we ate this big delicious meal. And so I feel like the task I have before me is impossibile, as they say in Italian. Uh, I don't know that I can speak over the dull roar of snoring that may begin to happen, but I'm going to try to do the best I can and get through this material. We look this morning at what we call the trauma of worship. I hope this will balance that out just a bit. We want to think about that sense in which worship engages our senses. It is a sensory thing. And to help us think about that, I'd like to once again have you consider another chapter from Revelation. This is chapter 4. We're skipping over the seven letters to the seven churches. And then John picks up the narrative when he says to us, Then I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard like a trumpet said to me, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. The one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white robes and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, as clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy to receive glory and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful to you for that place of worship. We thank you that there is a place where worship is perfect. We thank you that we see it as through a glass darkly, and yet even then it's glorious when we can share together in that praise of the one who is exclusively worthy. We pray that our reflection this evening on how worship can celebrate this one who is glorious would be accompanied through the presence of your spirit, opening our eyes and our ears to hear and to see this one whom we worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Some years back, you'll recall, there was an unhappy headline describing evangelical Christians in America as engaged in worship wars. Isn't that odd? What an oxymoron. Worship wars, you know. You don't hear that term so much, and I think the conflict has subsided happily. But it, at the time, as I understood it at least, represented a kind of conflict between what on the one hand was people more interested in traditional worship. We went through that in my church, people who believe that only the pipe organ is ordained by God, you know, for musical sounds in the sanctuary. And then there were others who were 
more inclined toward what were considered contemporary instruments. Well, the worship wars may have subsided, but that debate has actually been gone, going on a lot longer than simply something that happened in the 20th century. All through church history, there has always perennially been a conflict. It's not always been characterized as traditional versus contemporary or something like that. Probably the deeper common denominator that ties together this conflict, you might say, has been a debate between those who are more in, interested in the mind, a kind of cerebral experience of worship, and those who have a more sensory interest. And there's always been this kind of conflict all through church history. You can find it clear back in the second and third centuries, a debate over these matters. And so when we start getting involved in worship wars in our days, at least we're in good company, you know, because there's been a lot of this going on. Beginning of the 11th century, the character that's pictured before you is really at the center of the worship wars of his day. I wonder if anybody recognizes that handsome dude. Anybody know who that is? Take a guess. St. Bernard. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Born in 1090, just five years before Urban II called for the First Crusade. Born right at that turning point in church history when there was a bit of a conflict between those who were still wanting to retain an idea that worship should be all about things that are otherworldly. In fact, if you look at the art that was characteristic of the day, the imagery of objects that reflected the life of worship. They looked kind of weird, just between you and me. I mean, sometimes we look at pictures like that and we think, wow, those people were lousy artists. But the fact of the matter is, this was quite intentional. They were very good artists. They were doing something with a specific intention of giving the impression that these objects that are part of how we understand worship should not be regarded as part of this world. They are otherworldly. And so whether it's the Virgin Mary, the baby Jesus, even Jesus himself doesn't look too appealing, austere, distant, the Gothic architecture tended to call the mind artistically up to heaven as if to say things here on this planet aren't so important. It's what's up there that matters. And when it comes to the life of worship, we should be thinking about an otherworldly kind of experience. And then St. Bernard came along, and I don't know, maybe it was just in his DNA, but he felt like there's a different way to think about worship. And he became very interested in trying to find some notion of worship related to our experience of life here. And he established an abbey at a place called Clairvaux. Clairvaux means beautiful vision or beautiful view, which is ironic because the land that he chose to build Clairvaux was regarded as scab land originally. It was ugly, it was ignored, and Bernard intentionally chose that region and turned it into a beautiful showpiece of worship. One contemporary who visited the place said, at first glance as you enter after coming down the hill, you can feel that God is in the place. The silent valley speaks in the simplicity of its buildings and the true humility of the men of Christ living there. The silence is only broken by the music of singing or the sound of the hoe in the garden. I marveled and thought I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Bernard himself was considered one of the most remarkable men of his age. One contemporary said of him, in his countenance there shone forth a pureness, I'm sorry, I can't read it. That's right, a pureness of, not of earth, but of heaven. And his eyes had the clearness of an angel's and the mildness of a dove's eyes. Martin Luther liked Bernard. Bernard was a monk. It's remarkable that Martin Luther liked any monk. But he liked Bernard. 
He said of Bernard, Bernard is superior to all the doctors in his sermons, even to Augustine himself, because he preaches Christ most excellently. Luther said, Bernard loved Jesus as much as any man can. And remarkably, Martin Luther said, Bernard was the greatest Christian of the Middle Ages. He was an astonishing character in many regards. He was the Pope's closest advisor, but don't take that to mean he was a papal sycophant. In one letter he wrote to the Pope following, quote, You are despicable. In all circumstances, you know no law but your pleasure. You never think of God, nor do you love him. So he may have been an advisor, but uh, it wasn't uh, above his or beneath his dignity to render a bit of a critique when necessary. But probably the main thing that makes Bernard memorable from our point of view is he really revitalized life in the monasteries in his day with what was regarded as a kind of new sort of mysticism. This mysticism was different from that otherworldly prior mysticism because for Bernard he wanted somehow to engage the senses. He wanted us to understand that worship is not simply a kind of otherworldly experience, but something that should take place very much here in our present moment. He was a participant in the Second Crusade. The Second Crusade was a colossal failure. But for Bernard, it galvanized something. It was toward the end of his career, and he went to the Holy Land, and as I think probably some of you in this room have done, he stood at the Sea of Galilee, he walked the Via Della Rosa, he participated in some of those places where he could almost imagine he was back with Jesus in that human moment. And it only clarified for him all the more how important it is to have some idea that our senses are involved in the experience of worship. And so he inspired people in his own day, and actually, as it turns out, inspired others as well. You may, regard, you may re recognize this character. Who is that? Do you know this? You ever seen St. Francis? St. Francis, who is usually pictured, my clicker is at the edge of its limits here, usually pictured in nature. Ever notice that? Bernard is always surrounded by nature, especially birds. He seemed to have, really, a, a rapport with birds. On one occasion, he preached a sermon to the birds, you know. And when we look at the life of Francis, we notice that he radicalized life in the monastery because he abandoned it. In fact, the Pope rejected his appeal to establish a new order because he wanted to go out of the monastery, into nature, into the streets, into the place where people are in need and meet them there, you see. And he saw the world of nature as the world of service, and the world of worship. And he really transformed in some ways the vision even in his day. The great scholar of the Catholic Church, Thomas Aquinas, was born about the year that Francis died. Thomas Aquinas argued that we learn of God through the two books, the book of his words and the book of his works. And that as we look at nature, we see through general revelation something of the truth of God and it's discovered there. And it guides us in an understanding of how to experience God through the senses. Well, all of this had quite an impact, as you can imagine, over time. Art became a little bit more reflective of what human beings actually look like, still depicting great heavenly truths, this famous Sistine Chapel portrait by Michelangelo, the moment of creation, and yet the people who were there do look kind of human, don't they? Unlike that kind of Byzantine distortion. Many others came along, both from the Catholic and the Protestant side, sharing in a renewed vision of how we should be appreciating something of this world. Again, Calvin said, And since the glory of his power and wisdom shine more brightly above, heaven is often called his palace. Yet, in the first place, whenever you cast your eyes, there is no spot in the universe wherein you cannot discern least, at least some sparks of his glory. 
You cannot in one glance survey this most vast and beautiful system of the universe and its wide expanse without being completely overwhelmed by the boundless force of its brightness. The reason why the author of the letter to the Hebrews elegantly calls the universe the appearance of things invisible is that this skillful ordering of the universe is for us a sort of mirror in which we can contemplate God who is otherwise invisible. Now I don't know if you noticed it. We sang of this earlier. I love the words that we sang which really celebrate the point that I'm about to make. But there's one strand, there's one word that really ties together all of these characters. Bernard, Francis, Thomas Aquinas, Calvin. This word that lies beneath the surface that really is this common denominator among them is the word beauty. And one of the songs we sang earlier, I just loved it as we sang it, his beauty again and again. Well, what in the world is beauty? You know, we all have a sense of it. We all have some idea. It's something we experience with our senses and yet it is not, strictly speaking, sensory. It's an indescribable quality. It's perceived by the senses, but is not reduced to the senses. It involves all of the senses. The sense of sight, maybe what we think about first. How much of the description of that sanctuary that we find in Revelation 4 insisted on beautiful ideas? John sees a throne one sitting on the throne that has the appearance of jasper and carnelian, beautiful images. A rainbow is beautiful. We hear of a sea of glass as clear as crystal, beautiful. Later in Revelation, the New Jerusalem is described in language of beauty that taxes human vocabulary, attempting to say to us that there's something of this idea of beauty that is supposed to get us somehow or other into a place where we have some concept in our minds of God. What is beauty? I've taught philosophy over the years and whenever I approach the topic of Plato I always involve the students in a little exercise. I might do the same thing with you t this evening in which you look at two great works of art and try to assess which one is more beautiful. Okay. The first one you'll recognize, Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa. It's beautiful. And then another equally famous work of art, the Betty Sue. <laughs> and I asked the students, all right, tell me which one is more beautiful. Now I'm going to tell you for the most part, you know, it's not too tough. Although ever so often I would have a student who would play the devil's advocate. I remember one year I had a high school senior who stood up and t went on for 10 minutes arguing for the Betty Sue. The elegant lines, the subtlety, the soft curve of the smile, it all just said to him, this was an amazing display of genius on the part of the artist. I was happy to hear that, of course. The Mona Lisa the Betty Sue. I don't think any of us in this room has even the, a moment's hesitation assessing which is more beautiful. But you realize if you showed those two pictures to a dog, the dog wouldn't see the difference and wouldn't care. It's something distinctively human that we look at things, concrete and mortar, and see in it something else that we call beauty. And we see it all around us. We're constantly barraged by things. And we just say it in pain. Oh, isn't that beautiful? How do we know that? How do we know that something is beautiful and something else is not? What is that in us that registers that quality? Some say, especially in the modern age, deconstructionists, oh, beauty is just a subjective thing. It's just a matter of personal preference. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There's no such thing as objective beauty. 
But don't you agree there's something in us that screams out against that? That there is something objective. There's certainly a subjective aspect to it. But there's something else going on. It may very well be that the most profound philosophical investigation of the notion of beauty, not simply in America, but in the world, in history, was by this particular genius, whose name is, anybody recognize this guy? Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards has been studied meticulously by some of the finest scholars of the 20 and 21st century. Yale University, at vast expense, published in 26 volumes, each one three inches wide, the complete works of Jonathan Edwards. They didn't do that because they are evangelical Christians, friends. They did it because the man was a genius. And the strange irony is that we who are the heirs of his genius, evangelical Christians, ignore him like he didn't exist. And he's one of the greatest contributors to an understanding of what it is to worship that's ever walked the face of the planet. Perry Miller, the late professor of English literature at Harvard University, no evangelical, said the greatest philosopher America ever produced was Jonathan Edwards. He studied diligently by people concerned with understanding the subtlety of his insight. And Edwards had a few things to say about beauty. He made a distinction right off the bat between what he called secondary beauty and primary beauty. Now this is philosophy, but you people are professionals, you know? So gird up the loins here. Even though it's late and it's a little technical, it'll help you as it has helped me. His distinction between primary and secondary is this. We see beauty all around us. We look at things, a flower, a butterfly, a sunset, and we just casually remark of that thing that it's beautiful. And Edward C. says all of these experiences we have of things that we recognize to be beautiful are, in a sense, shining beauty through a stained glass. And on the other side is what he called primary beauty. And for him, primary beauty is, and always was, and he insisted on this, primary beauty is rooted in the holy. The reason there is beauty is because there is holiness. And the only reason we human beings call things beautiful is because we have a sense of the holy. And that's what distinguishes for us the sacred, the beautiful, from the mundane. In some ways, Edwards was answering the question that Rudolf Otto asked, only Edwards answered it 150 years before Rudolf Otto asked it. Rudolf Otto said, Though the numinous eludes the conceptual way of understanding, it must in some way or other be brought within our grasp. Else absolutely nothing could be asserted of it. And even mysticism, in speaking of it as to ariton, the ineffable, does not really mean to imply that absolutely nothing can be asserted of the object of the religious consciousness. Otherwise, mysticism would exist in an unbroken silence, whereas what's generally been characteristic of the mystics is their copious eloquence. He says, I grant you we can't say something directly about the numinous, and yet we keep trying, and at least to some degree, we must be able to say a few words. Well, Edwards answered that question. He said the point of contact between that ineffable, indescribable, mysterious aspect of God that's called the numinous, and the human experience of it is beauty. And thus, worship must always, in some sense or other, bring us to that which is beautiful. Another Edwardsian scholar, now deceased, Roland DeLotte, wrote a book on Edwards' understanding of beauty. He himself was a professor of American studies at the University of Minnesota. This entire book was devoted to an analysis of Edwards and beauty. And again, this man is no evangelical Christian. He's writing simply 
a summary of the philosophical analysis of beauty that he found in Edwards. He says, Delot says, it's the genius of Edwards settling on beauty as the most distinguishing perfection or attribute of God that he is thereby a concept in terms of which to insist at once upon the objectivity of God and upon his view that God can be fully known only to the extent he is genuinely enjoyed. That is to say, worship and celebrating the beauty that we find in holiness is to enjoy God. This is my book recommendation. It's not light reading. It's a scholarly work, but it will feed your soul. Even though it's not written by an evangelical, it is written so thoughtfully and reflectively of one of the greatest Christians in the history of this country that you can't help but appreciate and admire what the man has done. This is called Beauty and Sensibility and the Thought of Jonathan Edwards by Roland DeLotte, and I recommend it. So Edwards said that beauty bridges the gap between the rational and the non-rational in the knowledge of God. We said earlier there was this kind of conflict between mind and senses, the worship wars that have been with us all through the history of the church. And in some ways, Edward stepped into the gap and said the link, the bridge, is the notion of the beauty. Sorry, my clicker's going crazy. Sorry, one back, there we are. Edwards writes this, this is Jonathan Edwards. Reason is indeed necessary to it, that is to worship. We don't come to the experience of worship as um, insane people. I was coming up with more colorful language than I thought, well, I wouldn't be polite. So, we don't, uh, reason is necessary to it. But if we take reason strictly, not for the faculty of mental perception in general, but for rationalization, the perceiving of spiritual beauty and excellency, no more belongs to reason. Now stay awake. I see your eyes glazing over. The perceiving of spiritual beauty and excellency no more belongs to reason than it belongs to the sense of touch to perceive colors. You don't touch a chair and know that it's brown, you see. There's something else that tells us of this beauty. He says it is out of reason's province to perceive the beauty or loveliness of anything. Reason's work is to perceive truth, not its excellency. Reason may determine that honey is sweet to others, but it will never give me a perception of its sweetness. If you're here and you have a PhD in chemistry, then you can probably stand up and talk for four hours about why honey tastes sweet. And we can listen to four hours of you delineating all those reasons and it will not move us one iota closer to the experience of its sweetness, will it? There's a much more efficient way to experience the sweetness of honey. You taste it. And Edward says that's the problem with an overly cerebral worship. We talk all about the excellency of God. We never taste him. We never experience him. And what is the means, the mechanism by which we do that? It's somehow or other the experience of his beauty. Edwards himself is a remarkable example of a man who not only wrote of this, but wrote of his experience of it. This is the Edwards many people don't know, but it's a readily accessible one. This is from his personal narrative. Listen to this language. There came into my mind so sweet a sense of the glorious majesty and grace of God as I know not how to express. I seem to see them both in a sweet conjunction, majesty and meekness joined together. It was a sweet and gentle and holy majesty and also a majestic meekness, an awful sweetness, a high and great and holy gentleness. Edward says that this knowledge of God filters into our experience through beauty. The appearance of everything was altered. It seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast 
or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellency, his wisdom, his purity and love seem to appear in everything. The sun, moon and stars and the clouds and blue sky, the grass, the flowers, the trees and the water and all nature which used to greatly fix my mind. Edwards did warn, you can go too far with this. Just as he was protesting an overly cerebral experience of worship, which had tended to become dominant in that Puritan tradition that he represented, he also was concerned about those who just grab the sensations and leave everything else out, and he warned against that as well. He said, for example, because the joy of hypocrites is in themselves, hence it comes to pass that in their rejoicings and elevations they are wont to keep their eye upon themselves. Having received what they call spiritual experiences or discoveries, their minds are taken up about them, admiring their own experiences and what they are principally taken and elevated with is not the glory of God or the beauty of Christ but the beauty of their experiences. I think we've all seen that. We've seen those who simply become captivated with the feelings and forget the reason, the cause of them. And that, of course, can be a bit of an intoxicant that takes someone in a bad direction. They keep thinking with themselves, oh, what a great experience this is. What a great discovery this is. What wonderful things I've met with. And so they put their experiences in the place of Christ. He's really quite contemporary, don't you think? and his beauty and fullness. And instead of rejoicing in Christ Jesus, they rejoice in their admirable experiences. Edward says the primary safeguard against that kind of hypocrisy is to never forget that the beauty of God is the holiness of God. And everything we said about the holiness of God this morning plays in here. And yet in some ways this is expanding that other side, what Otto called the mysterium, this fascination with this God who just draws us to him. Edward says, I had vehement longings of soul after God and Christ and more holiness. My longings after God and holiness were much increased, pure and humble, holy and heavenly, Christianity appeared exceedingly amiable to me. I felt a burning desire to be in everything a complete Christian and conformed to the blessed image of Christ. I remember the thoughts I used to have of holiness and said sometimes to myself, I do certainly know that I love holiness such as the gospel prescribes. It appeared to me that there was nothing in it but what was ravishingly lovely, the highest beauty and amiableness, a divine beauty, holiness, as I then wrote down some of my contemplations on it, appeared to me of a sweet, pleasant, charming, serene, calm nature. It didn't take Edwards to tell us this. It may have been Edwards who helped us appreciate it, but if you're casually familiar with the biblical content on this point, you know it's all over the place. Worship in the Old Testament is dominated by themes of beauty, the priestly garments, the tabernacle and so on, the curtains, the different kinds of engravings that were included there. All of this was designed to communicate a notion of beauty. The first time in the Bible that the term being filled with the Spirit is used, the first time it's used, is in connection with people being filled with the Spirit to produce things beautiful. And that's found in Exodus 28. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may be a minister to me as a priest. And how many other times do we hear in the Psalms, a celebration of beauty. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house, <coughs> house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's a package idea, you see. And how many beautiful places are there in this world? that were calculated in their architecture to remind us of the holy through the sense 
of sight. This is the St. Chapelle Chapel in Paris. And it causes me to ask you, what sounds do you think make sense in a place like that? What is the sound that accompanies a place, a venue of beauty? I was in my first year of college, 100 years ago, a music major. That was my original stated major. I went to Whitworth University on a little music scholarship, trumpet player, and I was looking forward to majoring in music until I took a course called Music Theory. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I wasn't opposed to music theory, you understand. I thought this would be good. I was actually looking forward to it. But the first thing we had to do, and I think we spent half the quarter learning how to write Gregorian chant. Now, I'm kind of a free spirit, you know, sort of a creative genius. At least that's what I thought back then. And Gregorian chant really did hamper my style. <laughs> there are very strict rules as to how you write Gregorian chant. And I'm going to tell you none of those tunes that come out of those rules will ever make the top 40. It ain't going to happen. And I just got impatient with it. It's, much, it's very much to a discredit to me that I just got impatient. I was too immature to realize this is only the ABCs, you idiots. Hang in there. It'll get better. I just, I bailed, you know. And, uh, of course, I grew up, now, don't take this wrong, because I know many of you share this. I grew up a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian today, but I grew up a Baptist in a tiny little rural Baptist church. I thought the great hymns of the church were, I've got the joy, 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 joy <laughs> down in my heart. You know, I thought that was it. I thought this is the great music of the church, and Gregorian chant just wasn't cutting it for me. I'm not going to say a whole lot about music because there are others far more expert and I know you, you are having opportunities to hear this discussed elsewhere. So I'm just kind of bypassing this whole piece of the puzzle with a very truncated uh, comment or two. But it certainly, I think, is worth noting how much the sound, the sound of worship plays a role in what we see in the scriptures. The fireworks display of the 150th Psalm case in point. Praise the Lord. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him, praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. I like that. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. It's a little scandalous. <laughs> praise him with stringed instruments. There's the guitars. Praise him, praise him with flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Oh, you missed that? Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The book of Revelation, of course, celebrates this in so many ways. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet that said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Chapter 4, we just heard, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. Sorry, I hit it again. He opened the seventh seal and there was silence. Sometimes the sound of worship is silence. Just three quick notes about music. I want to move to some other things here. Music is a little bit like marriage in this regard. There's something mysterious about it that defies explanation. Paul says of marriage, it's a great mystery. We in this room who are married know that there's something that finally is a little bit un indescribable about the mystery of what is there, the beauty of that. And in some ways, music is like that. In some ways, it's a strange thing, isn't it? We just sing these elongated sounds together. What is this? And yet it moves us to tears. I tell you this morning, I'm telling you the truth, as you were singing, holy, 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 I had tears going down my face at the power of the beauty of that sound. This is God's creation. Music is not an artificial invention of human imagination. It is God's gift. And thus we need to treat it with a certain degree of respectful reverence because it is something of great worth. 
music style is important. But style, in my humble opinion, is not a box. It's not like there's one style. You know, some of us have been moved to tears by the Hallelujah Chorus. I have been equally moved by hearing kids sing, Jesus loves me. Those are not the same style, friends. But somehow in both of them you see the glory of God. Somehow in both of them you hear the beauty of the holiness of God coming through. Musical beauty is to the ear what visual beauty is to the eye. And you who are leaders of worship, I'm not trying to tell you anything more than you probably already know, but this has got to be in our minds. How are we letting music lead us to the holy in whatever style it may take? How about the sense of smell? We in the Protestant tradition have recoiled big time from the aroma of worship because we don't want to be like Catholics, you know, and their incense and all of that. But you got to face it, there's a plenty in the Bible about the aroma of worship. Hmm? Revelation, now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of all the saints. Chapter 8, another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar, that is the altar of incense. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hands. I'm not suggesting we should all run home and burn incense. In fact, in my own Presbyterian church, we had a very sincere, somewhat misguided music guy some years back, and he thought music or thought incense would be a great idea. And so one Sunday morning on his own, he actually had incense burning. Didn't know what he was doing. It set off the smoke alarms. We had the fire department at First Presbyterian Church interrupting our morning service to put out a fire because we had a music guy burning incense. So that's how good we are at it. So, you know, don't get me wrong here, but that there is a place for the aroma. It's a sensation and, and the senses. God has created us as beings with senses. As I was driving across the beautiful state of Montana yesterday, I drove through a little town and I saw off in the distance a fire burning. It was a controlled fire. They were burning leaves. And I stopped and got out of my car because I wanted to smell the leaves burning. I, I'm in Spokane County now. We don't burn leaves. You know, it's against the law. I grew up in Grand Coulee, near Grand Coulee Dam. That's where I'm from. Every fall, every spring, people burn leaves. It's a sweet, wonderful aroma. Do you realize the power of an aroma can take you back to a place more powerfully than any other sense and I was for a moment transported back to my childhood and the aroma of burning leaves. You could show me pictures or play sounds. It wouldn't have anything like the impact. What is the aroma of worship in your place of worship? It doesn't have to be incense. Maybe it should be fresh baked bread. Wouldn't that be nice to walk into services every Sunday and the place is filled with the aroma of fresh baked bread bread. You know, I could go for that. Back in ancient Israel, you probably are aware, there was a unique recipe for the incense that was burned at the tabernacle. It was illegal to burn that incense anywhere else. There was supposed to be something distinctively different about the place of worship, even in the way it smelled, as opposed to any other place on the planet. And as people would approach the place of worship, they would smell the incense in the air. And that powerful aroma would take them in some sense or other into the very presence of God. How about the sense of taste? John says, the voice I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the little scroll that lies open in the, angel, in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. 
So I took the scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You find taste shows up in Revelation in various places. The Old Testament Passover, bitter herbs were served. You can imagine a little kid chomping into some bitter herbs. Yuck, daddy, how can we have to eat this stuff? This is awful. And what does daddy say? You're right. Those are bitter herbs to remind us that we went, lived once under a bitter house of bondage and it was God's power that liberated. But lest we forget, we eat these bitter herbs to remind ourselves of that. Unleavened bread, crunchy, dry, same idea. Red wine, a very different message. All of these appealing to the sense of taste. How about the sense of touch? In first chapter of Revelation, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Jesus didn't stand 15 feet away and preach a sermon to John. What did he do? He walked over, touched him. Do not be afraid. How powerful is the laying on of hands? Many of you are pastors or you've been in pastoral ministry and all of us have had this experience of having someone lay a hand on us. In the ancient church, when congregations were quite small, it was customary for each congregant as they exited to have a blessing pronounced upon them as they departed individually, person by person. May I? Can I? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then the next person, and the next, thank you. How powerful is that? Do you know some of you, I mean, I'm getting up there. I'm 67 years old, you know. I'm an old man. I'm entering the last chapter. I'm losing my mind. You've noticed that. <laughs> the, the older I get, the more I appreciate touch. Some of you who've been pastors know that the older participants in your worship services come to church they might like the sermon, they might appreciate the hymns, they might think the prayers were fine, but really what they come to church for is to be touched. And as they're going out, they want the pastor to touch them, they want the pastor to take a hand, touch a shoulder, look them in the eye, have that personal contact, because we are tactile beings. We need to be, this is the grace of God coming to us through touch. Worship is a multi-sensory, multi-faceted experience. And we denude it when we reduce it to something which doesn't recognize how deeply, richly, we are invested in the experience of beauty. I'm going to finish off once again with this quote from Edwards. Listen to these words. He that sees the beauty of holiness or true moral good sees the greatest and most important thing in the world, which is the fullness of all things, without which all the world is empty, no better than nothing, yea, worse than nothing. Unless this is seen, nothing is seen that is worth seeing. For there is no true excellency or beauty. Unless this is understood, nothing is understood. This the beauty of the Godhead and the divinity of divinity, if I may so speak, the good of the infinite fountain of good without which God himself, if that were possible, would be an infinite evil, without which we ourselves had better never have been and without which there had better have been no being. Edwards put such a powerful, deep emphasis on this. This is that which God has given every one of us, a gift which carries us into the very presence of God through the vehicle of our senses. I don't know how to translate that into the particulars of your worshiping community. I'm simply laying this out here as a suggestion that we think in these terms, 
that we think about recognizing God's holiness, the great awesome reality that he represents, and yet at the same time recognizing that in the very core of that holiness is beauty, and this is God's gift to us by which we can somehow experience the holy in a way that is virtually a sensory experience, and yet it takes us into the very presence of God.